David Fowley, we are on the line. Oh. <laughs> First time caller. No, um, we're talking about On the Line, the uh, new <laughs> film starring Mel Gibson, uh, directed by... Now, I'm going to get this name right, because I took French for four years in high school, and this is hmm. a French filmmaker, uh, hmm. Romuald Boulanger, if I have that right. I Very probably good. don't. You could probably but, say um... it better than Mel Gibson, because he can't even... <laughs> he, he'd probably ask you to to say can i just call you bob <laughs> that was that was a nice little bit um so uh, i look i'm a sucker for movies about radio um with the exception of airheads i didn't quite uh like that one. <laughs> but uh no i mean pump i forgot up the... that, that was about radio <laughs> yeah <laughs> But pump up the volume, you know, talk radio, you know, these are kind of formative movies yeah. that came out right around the time when I was like, you know, yeah, you could actually like just say things against this against the system and authority and, mm -hmm. and people mm -hmm. hear it and start revolutions. You know, it's just kind of fun. And and look, you know, we're doing this now. We do podcasts regularly yeah. where we get on the air and, and spout out a bunch of nonsense and hopefully some insight uh, to people who will listen and, and get value from it. Um, so on the line should be right in my wheelhouse, especially because we're going through a bit of a, a melisance. Uh, yeah. Mel Gibson has been in, you know, a number of movies in the last few years. I know he was in a film that we talked about a couple of years ago that we really, both really loved, um, uh, Fat Man by yeah. the, uh, the Nelms brothers. Mm -hmm. uh, but this, this was a complete misfire for me. Although I have to give the filmmakers respect, uh, Boulanger wrote and directed it. There, I described the ending to my wife, who I know is never going to watch this movie, and she was like, "That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard." And I was like, "No, I'm not finished." <laughs> yeah, but wait, there's more. We'll we'll get into all of that. But David, what did you think of? And also, I'm ashamed to say we used to have a lot of fun talking about Saban films because they'd be like yeah. high profile celebrities who aren't quite doing the big mainstream box office stuff anymore. They're making these movies and they're not that great. But then, for example, Fat Man was a Saban film. They have in recent years started putting out some you know, pretty decent quality things. So Saban does not mean anymore what it used to. But no. this is kind of a slide backward, in my opinion. But tell yeah. me, what are your thoughts on On the Line? You could read my one and a half star review. Um, geez. Which will I, be linked I, down below, yeah, by the way. Yeah. I, I was game for it. Um, you know, the the fact that, you know, Gibson's got this deep, gravelly voice. I mean, it's kind of kind of great for a DJ or or he's not really a DJ. He's more of a shock jock. Um, you know, in my review, I, I wrote that, like, you know, this would have been good, like, a, a 90s thriller that was like released like maybe right after ransom or something you know ron howard's ransom or something just to show like mel's kind of you know diversity and his branching out i mean he played kind of like a uh you know a, kind of like a selfish somewhat despicable character in that movie where he was willing to uh do anything to get his son back except pay the ransom <laughs> but uh <laughs> but uh you know and, and so in this one i mean it it's really kind of like there's so many red herrings in the first like 20 minutes of this movie that it just it's so obvious it gets annoying like the movie opens up with like <laughs> like uh, the camera's focusing on like this like what looks like a puddle of blood in a kitchen and, and it's upside down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the camera is is closing in behind uh, Gibson, and he's like on a stool in the kitchen, and he's like going, <laughs> you know. And I'm like, all right. First of all, I find it hard to believe that, like, like right then, it was just not like I don't know. Gibson, I can't see him doing like he could do anger really well, but as far as like crying and like helplessness and or, or torture. I can't see that flying. You know, I could see rage and revenge, of course, you know, Mad Max, right? But this just, I'm like, all right, first of all, this isn't working. And then, of course, surprise. Oh, he's just playing with his little daughter, uh, who should be his granddaughter. Uh, because, I, I don't know, it just, um, anyway, uh, probably has third marriage, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, he's playing a character named Elvis Cooney. Um what's the show called like elvis live or something uh oh, no it's called it's called on the line on the, uh, but, on the line with yeah. elvis 
Right. But, and I think they even work in Elvis has left the building or something, oh, but no, yes. on, on the, uh, the t-shirt that our young, unfortunate, um, not an intern, but our new, newest staff member yeah. on the back that he's got a t-shirt that says Elvis. And usually the, the line is like, Elvis lives. This is Elvis live, but it's like L I V E. And I don't think we find out what the, what the acronym stands for, but it's a, you know, it's yeah. like, like many clever twisty things in this movie it's just so you can't even take it clever's being generous um so that's one red herring it's like oh he's not you know oh he's not in a, a tight situation or he's not you know in in trouble he's just playing with his but what if this is you know there's like foreboding music and then oh he's putting his daughter to bed kissing his wife goodbye and i just thought it was like uh okay it, it and he was going off to his shift, which begins at 10 p.m., okay? And I'm assuming this is like a weeknight. Uh, I, I don't know. Could be a weekend. But, like, who's listening to a radio show at 10 p.m. at night? Who listens to radio at 10 p.m. anymore? Or, or who listens to radio? You know, well, this it's goes like back a... to our Halloween ends discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, wait a minute, you know, um, and he, he doesn't. He doesn't seem to be, once we start to listen to his shtick where he's taking callers and you could see that these are somewhat loyal listeners, I guess. Um, it's not like he's Rush Limbaugh or necessarily Howard Stern or anything like that. He is, you know, it kind of has this acerbic wit about him and, you know, um, you could tell that, you know, maybe he's got this, you know, misogynic, you know, lean towards him or something but uh, you know he is there's one one caller call, calls in with um some you know relationship issues and he was just like oh well you need to hear each other out and both sides of the story that i'm like okay that's not bad advice and the, but it just seems like kind of like a a pat you know cut and paste answer um like like even though like gibson is you know if he feels in the first like maybe 20, 25 minutes, he feels like he's really, you know, there and committed to the role. The character he's playing just feels like he's going through the motions. This is, you know, a job that he's had forever. And on this particular shift, it's turning into his birthday. You know, all these things are kind of merging. You know, there's a guy in the lobby that shows up. He's, he's like this, you know, skinny looking, you know, Jared Leto reject kind of, you know, that, that claims he's the Messiah, takes off his shirt, and, oh, that's kind of foreboding. Maybe that'll play out later. No, it won't play out later because it's so obvious that it won't. You know, it's like this is so heavy-handed that it, it's not going to play out later. You know, so it's just like there's so many things that are like, hmm. Well, I mean, it's just it's it's an odd character. I don't know what this show is about, kind of to your point, because – as much as this guy he's renowned for pranks and jokes and being cruel to people on air, you're right. The the woman who calls in about, you know, the relationship problem she's having with her husband, he gives like compassionate advice. So I'm yeah. like, you're either Howard Stern or you're Dr. Drew. You're not going to be, the, you know, there's right. nothing really in between. And we only get like a quick montage of what this radio show right. is. But the rest of the movie is like, the cat and mouse, you know, the killer first. Uh, well, I guess we can kind of set it up. Of course, he gets a phone call from someone who's a crackpot who's like, I'm, I'm about to do something. I, you know, kind of, you know, freaked out about it. And, you know, he's Mel Gibson or Elvis is like, you know, don't do it. Calm down, whatever you're thinking about. You know, where are you? Turns out he's outside of Elvis's house, allegedly breaks in there's gunfire you hear the poison the, the dogs. daughter like kind of being held hostage and that turns out it's a big joke the guy is actually somewhere else but he does have the wife and daughter and it turns out they're inside the building and then it becomes like we're going to follow these people up on to you know follow the the voice the instructions up onto the roof and then through hallways and all this elaborate stuff but you know that's fine but i feel like we've seen it all before it also feels really low budget it feels like a covid production because there's only like two or three people on screen at any time and i'm not knocking people who are making movies during this time it's just that it it calls out there's such a dearth of like gripping material that i started thinking about things like 
oh, I, this is a cool location. I wonder if this hallway is the selling point because it's kind of got these diamond metal mm -hmm. panels on the on the bottom. And the poster of Elvis that we see a couple of times, I noticed that the angle on the portrait was kind of off. So the teeth were at the incorrect angle proportionate to his face. I'm like, this is the thing I'm, I should not be noticing or thinking <laughs> deeply about these things while a movie is going on about people being held hostage. Well, obviously you weren't uh, invested in the plot, so you had to look at something and notice something else. Um, uh, yeah, I, you know, it, it wouldn't have been bad if COVID was even involved in the in the storyline. You know, it's like um, maybe people were, you know, he has a conversation with his boss about how, you know, his his. Uh, his ratings aren't doing too good and he's really got to watch, you know, his approach and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's, 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 <laughs> it's, it's like the old uh, conversation that the chief used to have with dirty Harry, you know, it's like, come on, you gotta, you know, it's like, geez, come on. Uh, but that would have been cool to say like, look, since COVID more people are listening to radio, they're staying at home and listening to radio. You need to connect with them. You know, you need to reassure them. That would be cool. And he's just like, ah, I don't believe in this COVID stuff and blah, 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 you know. <laughs> and, and he could be here. You know, see, here I am. I'm, we do this all the time. We're freaking rewriting the stupid. I'm, I'm just saying it's like, you know, it would be nice if, if yes, these there are movies being made during COVID. So why not add, add that element into the story? I mean, nothing feels really... Uh, um, like there's nothing about this movie that feels like a real place you know it's like um yes he's driving to work for a 10 p.m shift but there's like zero traffic you know it's like the only thing getting in the way of him uh leaving his home to get to the to the studio are the opening credits you know it's like it's like it's, it's that's about it he gets in his mustang and did you notice he parks like right in front of the building where there's not really a parking spot it's like I'm just gonna park here. It's mo it's know? movie parking, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's you know it's like, you know something Cobra Eddie would do from you know <laughs> Stallone's movie. Um, I think they're both driving a Mustang, maybe I don't know. But yeah, and and Elvis is listening to the Chili Peppers. You know. Um, yeah. Why? It's like, and is he listening? To That's incorporate that. Or, is he or, listening yeah. to it, or is it just playing? And why is that Chili Pepper song playing? You know. You know he could. Well, I mean, to, to something you said earlier, like you don't even need the the kidnapper attacking action angle to this movie because there's something interesting about this guy. Apparently, I don't know how much Boulanger knows about like radio or American culture or American media, but Gibson's character, if we were to believe this, has been at that radio station for 40 years. All right. <laughs> Now, there are people who've had 40 year careers in radio, but mm -hmm. never like at this, like rarely at the same place. Like they they move around or whatever. Right, right. In different he's supposed cities. to be this. Right. He's supposed to be this institution. Um, but and I guess this kind of plays into the big spoilery reveal stuff, which we have to talk about. Sorry, folks, mm. uh, if you <laughs> turn back now, if you don't want to know. But there, there's there are so many ideas here that need to be fleshed out because on the surface, they don't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Like we're saying, he's this 65 year old guy who's, Hey, he's swearing on air. We could have at least used one cut to someone listening to this and hearing the bleep or hearing the, that get dumped because they're just yeah. like letting F bombs fly, you know, left and right on this show. And I'm like, am I supposed to understand that, you know, of course they'd censor it or is this some kind of like an alternate reality where this just flies? I mean, it would be great if it was an alternate reality. Um, it would be great if this movie was set in the 70s or something. So we could understand that, like, you'd have a lot more listeners tuning in. And it, even if it was, say, like, AM radio, you know, you'd have a lot more listeners tuning in to, you know, radio stations. Um, and you'd have a, a little bit more, you know, power, uh, regardless of his age, you know. And, you know, even when he's having that conversation with his manager, she's like, your social media presence sucks. It's like, duh, <laughs> who do you think you're talking to? I mean, this, this guy's a dinosaur. He's been in the business forever and you're expecting him to, what, throw hashtags up and, and post Instas? It's like, what? Look, How? okay, I, again, folks, I swear we'll get back to talking about the movie at hand, but th <laughs> these little avenues are far more interesting. David, imagine if this movie had just been, because they talk about an influencer <laughs> 
a guy with a, a comedian with a YouTube channel who's supposed to be the guest for that night's show. Mm -hmm. Imagine if it had been like this event where they invite this YouTube guy out of his basement to be on this radio show mm -hmm. and simulcast the radio show as a YouTube thing. And it's just this two hour conversation of this, like these two generations, like competing ideas. Like I'm sure Elvis Cooney is not woke by any stretch of the imagination. And this, you know, it doesn't even have to be a comedian. It could be just some kind of an influencer talking about the state of the world, the state of media, the generational stuff, you know, because the great thing about talk radio, uh, the Eric Bogosian movie, um, yeah. I, I, have you seen it? Oh, yeah, I mentioned it in my review. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, I did not have time to read no, the review I know, I know. during all the yeah. stuff today, but I'll read sure. it later. But uh, the great thing about that is there are some flashbacks to like his earlier days, but a lot of it takes place him being in the booth, talking to people, dealing with you know office yeah. politics and stuff. And then the big confrontation happens in the last minute of the movie, right? That's all the buildup. And you don't you could cut out that scene and just have him like go home and you'd still be left with a fantastic, you know, drama. This movie doesn't seem to have the confidence in the premise to, to make something interesting happen. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the very interesting thing about like a, a time when listeners were really paying attention to uh, either a DJs or talk show host or tuning in purposely because of a, a personality or a host uh, that time period's interesting. It's just not happening anymore. And so, you know, the time is interesting. And what I mean by that is the passing of time while you're doing that kind of job, it could be, you know, unrelenting. It could be tedious. It could be, you know, you know, I guess it could be interesting and depending on how passionate you are about your job. But if you've been doing something like that for over 40 years, you could easily be on autopilot and just, you know, coast through it. And, you know, nothing, you know, nothing shocks you. And you could get to the point where uh, if you're going to be, uh, if, if this is going to be modern day, then, you know, this guy should be instead of, instead of the manager talking about his lack of social media presence, uh, she should be talking to him about how he's on the verge of getting canceled on, you know, on social media uh, because of what the things he says, you know, so, uh, you know, that would be interesting, but, you know, I mean, it's, and, and that, we, that could tie into a great conversation. What if he says something live on the air and there are like the rest of the movie is him dealing with the real time repercussions of that. He starts losing sponsors or, you know, <laughs> his wife walks out on him or something because it comes out during the course of this, that he's sleeping with one of his, you know, production assistants. I, there's just, that's so all much. a joke. Um, yeah, there, there is a meaty movie to be told with this material, but that's not what on the line is. So let's let's take a station break and get back to talking about or, or get off the station break and get back to the plot of the movie. Um, yeah, Ashton is... Kutcher shows up and. Uh... <laughs> there is a young man named. Well, well Gary. Justin, I forgot. Justin, Justin is not the young man, but he's the he's the other radio the host green, who's got the yeah. earlier slot, right? Played by Kevin Dillon. Oh, played. What is going the, the, on? The saving grace of this movie is is kind of a usual suspects film in a way, because <laughs> once the twist happens, I told my wife this. I'm like, I almost burned all the pages and pages of notes I took about how none of this makes sense. The acting is terrible. Everything seems way too contrived and set up for something that is supposed to be happening spontaneously. Turns out there's a reason for all that. There's even a reason for Kevin Dillon's terrible acting in the beginning of this movie. I'm like, I know you're better than this. What is going on? Are you getting the same cut rate acting discount that they got Mel Gibson for? Because as you mentioned, he's like <laughs> sleepwalking through half this thing. Mm -mm. Uh, but then when the big twist happens, I'm like, Oh yeah, I guess that's kind of brilliant, but also it could be maybe they added on the twist because they got to the end of this thing in the edit and said nobody looks like they care during this movie. Uh, screw it. <laughs> right. We'll just make it all a gag. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, this this big reveal at the end. Well, there's two of them, and uh, you know, it turns out the the whole thing is I, it it doesn't make any sense because okay, let's go back to this whole Dylan character. He's new. This is his technically his first shift with Elvis, this he's legend. A, he's a Brit, a young 27-year-old Brit. Brit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
we're, yeah, there's that's being driven home many times, you know, from across the pond, you know. Um, and, and I guess, you know, I, I don't know, he's nervous about the job. I don't know, you know, whatever, but uh, they don't even establish that, you know, that it's not like he's a big, f- I mean, it does say he's a, he does say he's a big fan, but I can't really, the sincerity of that is questionable just because are you just, we don't know much about him. And is is he just saying that, or is he just, you know, cause it, it doesn't want to be insulted by this guy or what, you know? So yeah, it does seem like because he's not an intern, he's a new member of the staff. Yeah. So you would think that he would have had an interview. You would wonder. I mean, it's it's not really established that he's American. You get the feeling that almost like he came from the UK to work right. here. Like he's so had like, this type of job before somewhere else. Right. So you would think that he would either have an interview with Elvis at the very least. And B, also know what he's in for. Like, yeah, you're gonna yeah. you're about to get a job. If let's imagine this is the Howard Stern show. You're not gonna have some random person from pretty much anywhere saying, Oh, yeah, it's my first gig in the radio. I mean, you gotta be yeah, yeah, you gotta know somebody or at least be really on top of the right. show in order to get that position, like a lowly position on a huge radio show. Right. And you know, this movie would be a lot more interesting if it was if 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 Gibson's character stayed in the chair right at the mic, you know, mm-hmm. and instead, you know, once more lazy information is revealed, it becomes this kind of like cat and mouse hijinks kind of thing in the building. You know, we're still in the building, but we're just going from, we go down to the lobby, we go up the elevator, we go up the stairs, we go up these different, you know, uh, cubicle, the floor with cubicles and stuff. And, Oh, you know, there's this custodial guy. Oh, he may be a suspect or he may be fishy. It's like, but the whole time, like Dylan is walking around with Elvis, like not really doing much. Elvis is just like, hey, man, uh, come with me. I need you with me. And the whole time I'm thinking, why? Why is, why is you know, it, it, and then the big reveal is that this whole thing was a prank as some kind of like hazing, like, like, Elvis, Elvis orchestrated all of this, the whole thing. Like he can they contacted the local police and everything. The, the whole thing is just this like hazing for Dylan on his first day. That makes zero sense. Like zero. Right. I mean, especially going all because they said they'd spent like months working on it, which I believe, I don't believe that the cops would be okay with this. Because think, this yeah. is this is all going out live on the air. It's basically like a War of the Worlds kind of prank. You hear the gunshots. Yeah. You hear the the people like scream like, "Oh my God, Daddy, come save me!" or yeah. whatever. So at the very least, you would have because this is like downtown Los Angeles or whatever it's supposed to be. You'd have people showing up at the station. You'd need like a police presence because there'd be like onlookers like, oh, shit, this is where the this is going down live right now. I want to see the I want to see the explosion. You know, it'd be like the end of Ghostbusters. And there is even in the lobby, there even is that scene with the cop who shows up at the door and and, and, and he's like, like, supposedly they're like, there's supposedly like a bomb attached to the to the door and only they can see it from the inside. And so mm-hmm. Elvis and the new guy, Dylan, is there like, don't come close to the door. And the cop is like, don't you tell me what to do. And he Da-da-da-da. sounds just like that. I'm like, what's going yeah. on with this cop? He's like, don't yeah. do tell me what to yeah. do. Uh, you know, it's like, <laughs> what? What is happening? Um, it, you know, I mean, it reminds me of the, the cops from this uh, recent movie, Barbarian. But we could talk about this, so that some other time. But, you know, it... it, it it just doesn't play. The thing is, is why are you going through all this effort to haze this guy? Um, there's no established, like we did, we did research on this guy from, from the UK and he's supposedly a hot shot. So let's put him in his place. No, there's none of that. There's no reasoning or motivation behind this prank. It, it makes no sense. Well, also because we as the audience are privy to everything that's going on here, right? If, yeah. Well, I mean, but but we see that we see them going through the building and sure. like giving each other like shifty looks as like information's yeah. coming in over the line. But if Elvis's whole deal was to do this for the 
audience, and this is something that the movie could get into. It'd be a really interesting idea, but he could have orchestrated this whole thing with actors. And again, like done an Orson Welles type of thing, like a war of yeah. the world style thing. He could have made up the new guy. And, you know, at the end of the broadcast, like, Oh, we just did this to prank Dylan. He's our new, you know, Mm -hmm. team member or whatever they didn't have to involve the police or you know anything else like this they could have just written and produced this show for the radio but he decided to go through this actual hazing prank involving the cops involving like fake actors being fake horribly murdered in order to to get this guy but again he's just like he's just going to be operating the boards it it doesn't make any sense as you mentioned why do we care yeah it, it doesn't i mean that reveal at the end it makes it just like, I've just wasted my time. You know, this is just, yeah, this is really bad. And then, <laughs> and then it turns out they're pranking him. That doesn't work either, folks. It it does. And I'll tell you why. Because if you're spiraling down the toilet I mean, and it gets clogged, you just put the plunger in and make it go all the way through. Yeah. Um, or because you just hang I, on to the turd that's stuck to the side of the okay. It's gutsy. Like th that first reveal is stupid, but then yeah. to like double down, by doubling down, they basically quadruple down because I'm like, I did not see that coming at all. So yes, he gets into this black truck, like he's it's the next day or it's dawn, and you know, the cops have come and gone or whatever. Right. Because uh, Dylan, the uh lowly, we'll call him an intern, I don't know what he's supposed to be. He the new guy freaks the new guy. He freaks out because at the moment when the killer is, you know, he drops the detonator. Of course, is a black de detonator, the bright red <laughs> button. It's like if I take my thumb off this thing, the whole building this, blows. The whole building's you know, gonna blow up. Yeah. Right. He drops the detonator. You get this awesome slow motion oh, reaction from everybody in the room. Nothing happens, and there's a beat, and then everybody except Dylan starts cracking up hysterically. It's almost like an outtake, and they reveal, "Hey, it's all a big joke." Dylan is sufficiently freaked out, and this is this is like the this is almost like the devil's advocate thing, where like you realize that you're going to work for Satan because Dylan backs out of the room in horror, and then everyone starts going, "Oh, come on, don't be that guy!" I'm like, "Yeah, what wait, what, what, what guy?" You know, it's like, <laughs> wait a minute. Don't be so that guy. He, so he's backing away and he backs right down the stairs and he breaks his neck and dies. And so there's this great moment where everybody's like, and it's all still live on the air. And like, oh my God, we actually just killed someone on the radio. The next, you know, a few hours later, the sun's up, the investigators have come and gone, and Elvis is going back to his home. His boss pulls up in a big black truck and says, get in here. And she starts dressing him down. He's like, I told you you're going to go too far. And he's like, yeah, I'm sorry. And she's like, driver, turn on the radio. And they turn on the radio. It's a rival station. It's like, hey, this is Jack LaDouche from KLX2 uh, with a special message for Elvis Cooney, who I understand had some trouble at the radio station last night. Happy birthday. And then the driver turns around and it turns out it's Dylan all alive and well. He's a professional stuntman, everybody. He takes falls for a living. Mm -mm -mm. And then they get out and it's like the end of Empire Records. Everybody is just so happy. And they're like, I can't believe you guys got me. Oh, you rascals. I wonder what we're going to do tomorrow. And then cut to black. Mm -mm. Go ahead. Sure. It helped ratings. This. This it, it is not just, the kind of movie you think is going to have like a happy sitcom kind of freeze frame ending, but it does. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, I was baffled because it's just like, okay, I'll admit that that part where they're pranking him was kind of ballsy. Um, but at that point, I'm just like, really? I, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just like, uh, I just spent like all this time, you know, just, just, wasting my time with this stupid story and then you're just gonna like double try and double prank me no um i would have been happy with just the complete hack ending where dylan just like leaves the station in disgust and then elvis is like i guess some people can't take a joke and then cut to six months later and elvis takes a call on his show and it's fucking dylan like i'm, be awesome. I'm inside your house <laughs> yeah not this again <laughs> have we been here before um how about how about that scene where where they're on the roof and you know the, the whole the drone thing and everything and i'm like wait a minute uh, it's like doesn't it okay 
if that's the story, it's like, okay, so basically Gary's on the air and he's like, I want, he's like supposedly ex-military. And, yeah, Gary's and, the and, guy and, who's and, calling yeah, in and the, he's yeah. the assailant, yeah. Yeah, and, and he's mad at, at Elvis because, you know, Elvis made one of a previous, like, intern, um, you know, uh, commit, basically commit suicide because she was so uh, distraught over the, the things that he would say about her on the air, even after she was gone. Okay. That could be legit. That could be a good story, but that's never developed anything by beyond just mentioning it. Um, but Gary is supposed to be at his house, you know, holding his, you know, daughter and, and child, uh, well, not ransom, but, um, you know, uh, hostage. All right. So, Who's controlling the drone? You know, it's like, aren't why, why don't they do that math? It's like, okay, if Gary is at home, then there's either somebody here in the building helping Gary or nearby the building controlling this drone, watching for Gary. So what's had, going in? A it's a great point. I hadn't thought of that because I was, I dare say, caught up in the moment of like, where is this going to go? I did think it was a really cool shot of, well, the whole thing is, Gary orders Elvis and his team to go up to the roof, then tells, uh, I think, Elvis. Dylan, you need yeah. to push Elvis oh, yeah. off the, the building. Mm -hmm. And so he d claims to have done that. And he's like, OK, he's he's gone. He's like, I need proof. And so they, you know, they're like, you wouldn't lie to me, would you? And then all of a sudden, this cool shot of the drone, because you hear the, the kind of the humming, <laughs> the drone comes up. And I just liked. This is way artsy fartsy than I think Bollinger had in mind, but like I saw the two glowing red eyes is like the the searing eyes of judgment or something, right, and then you right. see the drone take off. I'm like, that's kind of a cool idea. I don't know that it makes sense, but you know, it's at least something interesting right. to look at, right? Yeah, 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 um, yeah. I just I just feel like there there could have been maybe a little bit more backstory a little bit more you know dirt or drama uh with you know some kind of backstory with elvis or something uh but you know that well, even even this um the the girl who was allegedly who committed suicide i don't remember yeah. if her name was laura or something like that i think lauren yeah lauren okay so the whole idea and of course it's all a fake story but yeah um she had worked like for a very short time at the radio station. Apparently like she quit after like a couple of days or like maybe a couple mm -hmm. of weeks. And then she was upset because he kept taunting her on air. I'm like, Hey, it's again, we've established it's the radio. Yeah. It's late night radio. You Who's don't have listening? to listen to. No one's listening to it. On top of that, if you were like the switchboard operator, the intern at the station, it's not like a YouTube channel where like it's video. Like, yeah. oh, this is Lauren, my intern. No one knows who that is. No one is. knows you. No one knows you. <laughs> You're you not on it's, billboards, it's, yeah, right? It's, yeah. not, it's not a YouTube YouTube channel. Yeah, and, and as I was watching this, I was thinking, okay, what? I mean, really, what's popular now? Either YouTube channels or podcasts. T TikTok, so, yeah. Yeah, TikTok too, yeah. I mean, pick one of those. And if it's going to be set in today, just pick one of those. Um, and, and it would just be hilarious for somebody, you know, gibson's age he was been in the radio for 40 years to be like what i gotta be doing tiktok videos now what are you talking about um i could see like maybe a, a youtube thing you know but I, I don't know i just like i know how like podcast shows like kind of like limited series like you know murder mysteries and all that are pretty popular so I'm like, if this would have been like a popular podcast, like, you know, in like seasons or something, I could see that. But like with people tuning in and, and you're loyal, you know, you pay for it or whatever. But I don't know. I just don't see I, I didn't buy into the fact that, you know, here's this kind of hangdog kind of guy who's kind of grizzled, and you know, leathery and, you know, world weary and just like, you know, showing up to work. And he keeps on asking everybody, are you going to watch my show? Are you going to listen to my show? He asked his wife, are you going to listen to my show? And she's, you know, you get the idea that, you know, she's kind of like my wife who never reads my reviews. She's like, yeah, I guess I will, you know, <laughs> you know, and, and she's like, I guess I will later. And, she, and you know, it's like, OK, you know, and then he shows up at, in the lobby and he asks the security guard. So you excited about the show tonight. And he <laughs> the, the one part was kind of funny where he's like, 
the, the security guard's like, yeah, I'm really excited about the show. And he's talking about like a reality show, kind of like a Dancing with the Stars type thing. And he's like, no, my show. It's like, nobody's listening to your show, dude. Nobody. So it, it's like, he's all the, he's got all this, I wish they would have developed this kind of like, you know, over kind of like over the hill, you know, over middle age kind of angst about like, you know, I'm irrelevant, you know, nobody's listening to me. I don't, I don't feel seen or heard, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's <clears throat> hopefully someone out there has either watched on the line or is watching this show and is like, I'm going to, I'm going to give Ian and David what they want. Cause I want to watch right. the movie that we're yeah. kind of describing and building here. Take whatever I, elements that we've talked about and make a good screenplay. <laughs> just give a special thanks at the end. Now, mm-hmm. at, what I loved is that this movie kind of knows that it's garbage because, oh, I know and I get the say. feeling, I get the feeling that there's either mm-hmm. actor ad libs that were just left in or something, or maybe Boulanger was so, in love with his own meta ness that he's like, I can put these critiques in here and it'll all be worth it. Um, so, uh, God, what does he say? There's, Doesn't there's he say something like some kind of B movie, something or. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Someone said this could make a great movie. Uh, I, I, I think sarcastically, I think you need a rewrite. Sounds like a real stinker. Yes. Um, I was like, wait, what, huh? what kind of B grade movie bullshit is this? Yeah. And, um, and, you know, you, you mentioned meta. I mean, the, obviously those lines are very on the nose and meta. Uh, even this, the portrayal of this character, I mean, at this point, you know, Gibson has done a pretty good job since his controversy of playing kind of despicable characters and, you know, just kind of, you know, rough and tumble characters, you know, n- not necessarily a whole lot of roles with, you know, uh, that that weren't any real sympathy or you know kind of like you know nice guy sensitive roles he's really kind of uh leaning into I, I don't think it's really purposeful but he just happens to be getting these roles of like leaning into almost how the public perceives him you know um and and so it's like this character this kind of like guy that's just tells it like it is you know um I mean, it could have been a lot darker and it could have been a lot more, you know, uncomfortable and more, uh, a lot more meta. That would have been like way too, uh, you know, on the nose, you know, very similar to how the public perceives him. Um, and, and that dig would have been into, interesting. Dig into that. Yeah. Have him yeah. be someone who got canceled for a drunken, you mm-hmm. know, uh, calling a cop sugar tits and, you know, some quotes from i don't remember was it his father or was it him when he was drunk but like this whole thing about like you know the anti-semitism uh which I, you know his, i think his there was him, him for yeah. a year a decade and i think yeah. but i think there was something related to his father perhaps holding some you know similar views but you know there was a great speech i think robert downey jr you know presented uh, Mel Gibson with an award or something in a presentation a few years ago. And it was just great because he was talking about, look, I know what it's like to be down, essentially down and out in Beverly Hills. Uh, it takes forgiveness. It takes compassion and understanding. And Mel Gibson was one of the people who was always there for me. And now I'm mm-hmm. kind of like on top and he's, you know, people are giving him a hard time. So cut it out. You know, you could build an entire movie about that yeah. with Mel Gibson, you know, kind of a, a meta narrative about, how yes he's been canceled and he's all these awful things but he's still a you know a human being who's got flaws just like everybody else yeah and, it's you know, called not Air necessarily america def- too well <laughs> oh my gosh i forgot that was yeah that was that connection that was like 1988 jeez but yeah. yeah so i let's talk for a second about gary our uh our assailant <clears throat> he's a little bit too like canadian game show host joker and at one point he does do a joaquin <laughs> phoenix bit like who would play me in the movie guy you know i, don't know. I think joaquin phoenix he even yeah. says like joaquin weird like joaquin i'm like what you know it just seems like maybe tom cruise can play you and i think i'll be joaquin it's like no stop this you know i'll give him points for not saying you know you <laughs> I think Mel Gibson would be great as you. <laughs> no, that would have been awesome. <laughs> to play Elvis, yeah. He's like, no, um, that guy's an ass, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no way, that, anti, that anti-Semitic asshole, no way. <laughs> oh, that would have been great. Um, but, I mean, you and 
you and I, I mean, we're able to separate, you know, the reality uh, from the artist and we're willing to give, you know, Gibson a chance. Uh, some people aren't. I understand that. And that's totally their decision and prerogative. Um, he's done some good work. He's, you know, Fat Man was good. Dragged Across Concrete was good. I even liked The Beaver, you Boss know. Level. Um, Boss Level was fun, you know, a nice little cameo. I mean, but, you know, he's getting to be like Bruce Willis lately. I mean, he this is like the sixth of eight movies this year that are going to be released with him in it. I mean, he did another Kevin Dillon thing uh mm -hmm. earlier this year you know and it's just like um okay it, did, i mean i guess i don't know it, once once he heard maybe once he heard that bruce willis is retiring he's like all right i'll take over you know well, and... here, here's the thing I, a couple of points one i'm not gonna blame the guy for taking what he can get because i mean you gotta imagine yeah 30 years ago he went he was making 20 million dollars a movie and now he's probably making 20 movies at a million dollars each. You know, he's True. just got to he's not where he was. Yeah, I was watching uh, Casper, the Christina Ricci movie last weekend. Wow. OK. And I forgot he makes a brief cameo in it. There's the bit where he's, uh, ch I think, changing face. Uh, uh, or maybe it was um, Bill Pullman's character is like looking in the mirror because he's turned into a ghost or something or one mm -hmm. of the characters is and they start doing this like montage of them changing into different celebrities like Clint Eastwood's in there Hilarious. and Mel Gibson was one of them and it was actually totally, him right totally forgot yeah. about that um, right but the, the whole point is he's not where he used to be and so he's probably still wants to work he's probably you yeah. know, invested in some point in the scripts that he's getting and this isn't exactly a Bruce Willis situation yet because he's front and center and all throughout the movie true I true know Willis um, has had his issues but in right. recent stuff it's like yeah he'll he's on the poster but he's you know sitting down at a cafe for true. five minutes and that's him in the movie now now granted gibson has done roles like that in these like almost like b movie vod type movies but yes this is a lead role he is the main character in this movie he's carrying this movie um and granted, I, I mean, I heard he did a good job in the supporting role in Father Stu earlier this year. Um, so, you know, I, I, I the material is, you know, there. It's just it seems like uh, are we looking at like one out of eight movies released in a year are going to be, you know, a decent form? Um, maybe be a little bit more picky, I guess. Um, and, and I would re really love to see him back behind uh, the camera. You know, I mean, Hacksaw Ridge was good. He directed yeah. it. You know, yeah. so and I heard, uh, which doesn't make me too happy. Maybe Saban will pick this up, but uh, his next. Well, he's got a he had some a rumored thing for a while, but I think that the next thing that he's thinking about doing is directing Lethal Weapon Five. No, is that six? Would that be six? Yeah, six. Lethal Weapon Six. Is that? I thought it was five. Five. If I, it'd be five. Yeah, okay. because fourth was with Chris Rock. Yeah choose um yeah so i i can't see that happening because it's like you're not at that level anymore where people are going to be drawn to a mel gibson lethal weapon i i just don't feel that that could work you know but i've heard that lethal weapon 5 is on in some capacity i don't yeah. think it's going to be Riggs and murtaugh you know doing the whole thing it's going to be just like the ghostbusters thing it's gonna be a passing of the torch yeah. movie right yeah you know, uh, Danny Glover is going to be the the beleaguered police captain who's got, you know, I don't know what young star they're going to get, but he's going to be the the Gibson character. Mm. And he's like, I, I, you need someone to, to show you how to straighten up. And they're going to get, is it Martin Riggs? Was that, was that Gibson? I always get Riggs and Murtaugh. Can, uh, can yeah, continue. Riggs. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, you know how it's going to work, right? <sighs> it's yeah. going to be one last hurrah, but it's going to yeah. be mainly about the kids, which I'm fine with. Um, I don't know that I'll watch it or enjoy it, but you know, he can do whatever he wants. Um, I, I just want to pull over for a second and just talk about like the whole Mel Gibson thing, because, and we might've talked about this before on fat mm -hmm. man, because, you know, he's got this reputation of being anti-Semitic and probably racist and a drunkard and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But most of what I feel like we know or think we know about him is from, you know, press stories and, and hearsay and, and, and isolated incidents. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked to the Nelms brothers, uh, you know, about Fat Man a couple of years ago. And we asked them about that. And they said that he, they didn't have any 
issue with him. They had kind of talked about it and they had the same kind of concerns before taking on the movie with him. You look at a movie like On the Line, which has a very, you know, it's it's diversity cast, you know, from <laughs> front to back, right? So you just wonder, are these people all in it for the paycheck? If they really thought they were going to be working with this reprehensible, you know, vile creature, would they have signed on? Because right. again, it's not like it's not like they're in Lethal Weapon Five, which is going to be like on four thousand screens or something—a big, you know, Fox mm -hmm. production. Mm -hmm. It's a Saban film showing up on VOD. So, yeah, um, I, I'm with you. I mean, I, I feel like even let's let's say that all that stuff did happen, and you know, it is recorded somewhere. So, yeah, sure, um, I'm sure he said stuff, you know, when he was drunk and or whatever, uh, but. I, I don't understand, like, how long do we hold this over somebody's head? You know, it's like, you know, Louis C.K. is going back on, on tour, you know, and, and he's, he's you know, it's like, and I know some people who, oh, I'd never go see him again. It's like, why? Because he masturbated in front of people? Um, or or what, you know, it's like, or, and I, know, I also know other people like, oh, I got to get those tickets, you know? So it's like, I don't, I can't. I can't, I don't know. I, I can't be uh, focused on how certain people are responding or, or not responding to uh, the behavior of uh, a celebrity uh, right. who, who is human, you know, and, and fallible, you know, and, you know, we, man, if, if somebody combed through my life, you know, and, and I'm sure it's like, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I just feel like even like the whole Kevin Spacey thing, it's like, what do we do with him now? You know, I, I don't know. You know, it's like, what do we do with him? What do we do with all these people? You know, we just, well, I mean, Kevin put Spacey him in the phantom zone, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Spacey's a different beast though. And, it, and that's, it was, I know we're kind of getting off a tangent, but yeah. I think we're done talking about on the line. <laughs> we're, um, we're off the line. Right. But, but Spacey's different because I mean, at least with Mel Gibson, I don't, I haven't heard any interviews where he has been, you know, apologize for anything. I mean, maybe he has, but he's at least out there trying to do the work. And from all accounts of people that I've heard who've worked on things with him, you know, he's generous. He's very giving. He's committed to the work. Right. With Kevin Spacey, you know, you hear very different things like he's going on you know, a couple of years ago. He's making like creepy YouTube videos about like how like he got busted for me too but then there's like all this other stuff that was going to be coming out right. it's not like he's denying it but he doesn't seem to be uh contrite he's just kind yeah. of doubling down on his ghoulishness like well i'm canceled well fuck all of you you know right right yeah which is again um, a shame because i i think b before a certain point and it was very recently with baby driver that was like his last big thing yeah i was a huge and still am a huge fan of kevin spacey's work i'm just not yeah. necessarily a fan of the guy and i can separate that totally yeah i don't know if he'll ever reach the same performing heights uh that he did beforehand because i don't know the material will necessarily be presented to him to do that but yep. i can still say yeah usual suspects is a hell of a movie yeah you know? i mean you could really say american this, beauty you could say the same thing about you know musicians sports figures politicians you know it's like if, look you know anybody's in the public eye it's like you know I, well i i i like what they've you know they, they've done but i don't like them as a person okay all right but just to say i'm never going to watch anything they do or i'm never going to give this person I don't, I don't know i mean i understand that but i don't prescribe to that yeah I, i'm Sub subscribed you know, to it. yeah i i'm in the same position because it's you know once you start cutting out you know coming up with those those really harsh kind of standards you cut yourself off from a lot of uh you know powerful art i think yeah. um, and my position is there are tons of people who haven't been caught yet right <laughs> not to say there's anything wrong with steven spielberg or tom hanks but let's just say something comes out of them like in five years are, are we never going to be allowed to watch jaws and et again gasp gasp <laughs> yeah. all right well david thank you for talking about on the line do you have any final thoughts before we go to a station break um i you know i kept on thinking of like this on the line you know and i kept on thinking of like other mel gibson titles like bird on the wire you know on the line i, I don't know i was just you know yeah goldie hawn would have made this movie 25 percent better it would have been awesome if Goldie Hawn was like his boss or something or his wife. You know, it's like I, that's the other thing. It's like, OK, we briefly see his wife. And again, it looks like it could be his daughter. 
I'm like, uh, uh, why can't we, uh, can't we have somebody who's his age or something, you know, Rene Russo old, make a cameo and that would be fun. old women. Don't bring in the, the you know, nah. they don't bring put asses in seats. Don't you yeah. know? It's a, it's a young gal's game. Yeah. It's a, yeah. it's a travesty. Cause I, yeah, that's the, that's the, the one thing I'll, I don't think I'll ever get over is the casting, the, the older actor with the, with the younger, you know, ingenue or whatever. I mean, it's a, it's yeah. a trope and everything, but yeah, there's some, there's some great older, you know, I'll just say more experienced. I don't want to be totally insulting actresses yeah. out there who are still yeah. not only beautiful, but capable of oh, being yeah. in these movies. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. So now that we've, now that we've canceled ourselves, um, thank you, David Fowley of keeping it real. Um, folks check out David's review, his one and a half star review of mm. keeping it real, which we'll link to down below. And uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about some other things coming up uh, real soon. I don't want to announce anything yet because I got to put together a schedule. But uh, yeah, this has been fun, and I'm looking forward to talking movies with you some more. Yep, we're in that season. Yes, sir. All right, take it easy and uh, talk later. All right, thank you. <laughs>